Thank you for coming. Welcome. Um, yes, it, I think it's an extremely valuable tape because it covers lots of areas which I think tie up ends for people in terms of <coughs> the work that Halliday was all about. And it goes off into um, astrology and then it goes through the astrological description pretty well. Um, and I just think it's one of those that links so many different areas that you'll find it very valuable. I certainly, yeah, it was, it was sent to me by John Bailey, the transcriber, and he said, he liked it a lot. Could I sort of have a go at um, proofing it, and proofing it, reading it, which I, I didn't do because he said someone else did it for him. Um, <coughs> so there are one or two little slips in it. I've corrected a few from when we did it at Tally Garth. Um, so if we spot any, put it, just mention it to him, and I'll ring, ring it for him. But I was really quite taken, particularly with the way it starts out talking about resonance and harmonics, etc. And what that passes over and conveys to us in terms of how we as a human being have access, literally, to tuning into so many different things, so many different areas. Um, so, <coughs> without any further ado, we shall plunge in. Right, <clears throat> so John's got the standard sort of transcript disclaimer at the top, that the drawings aren't the originals, Halliday just started talking, the titles have been put in by John to help you find your way through it, <coughs> the, the um, diagrams have been assumed by him and in tune by him and uh, put in by him, so all those are, are added afterwards. Um, to divide up the talk and to actually help us understand it and catalogue it and hopefully be able to search it as well because you can now search all these if you go onto the website. That means you can put in a subject and it will go through all the talks that are actually on the site and bring out all, all the relevant sort of paragraphs that Halliday mentions where that topic is discussed. Right, so, <clears throat> question from a member of the audience. What I wanted to ask about was the way in which you assimilate food. You said it was similar. You assimilate out of the food what was similar to yourself. And I was thinking about the way in which you tend to group with similar people. And I wondered if there was a link there. Kind of in this constant gathering of similars. <clears throat> well, yes, well, you can see logically why only like substances can assimilate. You know, for instance, if you take the organic compounds, you're really dealing with nitrogen compounds, aren't you? You must have something that is in some way similar to many things if you wish to bind a lot of things together. You can already feel that he's starting to pull a wide area of thought together under one title. He's already lassoed a lot of subjects here. Is that why it's a catalyst again? <clears throat> Consciousness as catalyst. Similar, except that in the catalyst you have a substance that doesn't <coughs> itself take part in the reaction. It's just its presence that determines it. Like we said before, that consciousness is a catalyst. If you see a child playing and it doesn't know that you've noticed it, that you've noticed it and you keep looking at it, very soon the child alters the character of the play. It's aware that it's under observation, and the fact that it's being watched changes the character of the action. I'm assuming everybody knows what a catalyst is, it's used in chemistry, etc., yeah. and it, it doesn't actually participate in the reaction, but it, it tends to make it happen. It, it often kicks it off, or, or smooths the way, or makes it more efficient. Okay, so he's saying, in the broader picture, 
our consciousness is a catalyst. As soon as it gets involved in the situation, as soon as you make yourself present with your awareness, it changes the whole sequence of events and the things that are happening. And the same thing happens with any human being. The moment he becomes conscious of what he's doing, then the action tends to change itself. Consciousness in that sense is a catalyst, because con consciousness does not itself participate <coughs> in anything whatever. It is, a just, sorry, it is just a permanent background of all activities. You can say, if you like, that everything, every person, is inside consciousness. Now, a person is literally when you perceive something. So, whenever information comes into you, into your consciousness, you can translate it as a percept. And we say we perceive things. And perception is when we're actually noticing, we're, we're, we're blocking the vibrations that are coming in, whether it's through our ears, through our eyes, through our taste buds, whatever it is, that's what a percept is. When we spin them together into a structure inside our heads, that's a concept. Both of them are to do with cutting. That septic, that, that, that set part is a cutting action. It's where you're actually <coughs> slicing the whole literal um, caboodle of information that's coming at you. You're grabbing a bit of it and you're cutting it off from everything else and you're noticing it. Okay, that's why it's, it, it's actually through cutting. You're cutting through things, per means through. You're cutting through things and you're grabbing a bit. Allardy used to say, if you look at the anatomy of the eye, you can see it's actually, it's grown down, little eye bulb inside the child. It opens out like this and makes a great grabbing thing, a great spherical grab like that. And it makes a very tight focus pattern here so it can actually <coughs> analyze information that comes at it. Without that lens, it wouldn't focus thing on the back of its eye, but it's grabbing information. It's looking intensely. So that's like a, a grabbing action. And with all our senses, we're actually receiving dis distinctly, intensely, what we want to sort through. And that perception is grabbing, literally, a part of the vibration in the world that's coming towards us. So you can say, if you like, that everything, everything, every percept is inside consciousness. The consciousness itself is not of them, but they are it. <coughs> they are like the ripples on the sea. <coughs> ripples can fall down and leave the sea the calm. You can imagine the sea calm without ripples, but you can't imagine the ripples without the sea, which establishes the priority of substance, doesn't it? Now, he's just gone through a great deal of very significant Indian metaphysics there, because what he's saying is that we, as human beings, are that great sea. We are this great ocean, but we don't notice the ocean, we don't notice the consciousness that we are, until there's a wave. And we see the wave motion like this. And we recognize that, and we can count them, we can measure them. In a few moments we're going to be talking about that too. We can count these waves and these measurements, and these are the forms, or the shapes, which exist inside consciousness. And most people only consider consciousness in terms of the shapes that are inside it, because that's how we know it's there. But the essence of the great Indian method is the great... The, the, essence of literally this thing is to recognize this thing here is Purusha. That great sea of knowingness not the things known but the knowingness is this great space in which things happen. And we think it's inside our heads but it's never been limited in that sense. And if you can if you can hold the concept of the universe inside your head, that's a pretty big concept for a fairly small head. So what you'd have to say is that you know this whole everything you know, everything you've ever perceived, is in, happened inside your consciousness. And in, as that, you are that space in which things happen. 
we tend to have things which appear regularly inside us, like the place where we live and stuff like that, and the books that we read and the newspaper and the TV programs. So we can tend to get identified with that. And we tend to think that we are those particular forms which we regularly see inside our consciousness. But if we identify with the consciousness, so it says in all the ancient texts, we are much more effective as human beings because we're not limited in the same sense. And we can allow <coughs> new forms, new thoughts in, and we can allow new situations to be responded to. Whereas if we have a limitation, if we identify with any form inside that thing, we are limiting ourselves. But it's easy to get caught on them because consciousness itself has no taste, no smell, no size, no anything. It's just pure experience without experiences inside it. So we, we only know it and recognize it by, if you like, counting the waves. And that's what he's saying there. I'm just going to read it again because it's a really good description. It's one that Patanjali uses, we've, we've discussed Patanjali before, when he talks about the mind where you have to allow the ripples to subside in meditation. You allow the, the ripples of thought processes and the perceiving to subside. <clears throat> and then you can see literally the calm and the peace of the consciousness itself, which is pure stillness, <clears throat> when it isn't identified or caught on any of these ripples. Whether the ripples actually stop is a moot point. But the thing it is, what is important is if you're not identified with them, you can recognize the ripples as pure waveforms, which, as he says, are not the ocean itself. They're, they give you awareness of the ocean, but they're not the ocean itself. Consciousness in that sense is the catalyst, because consciousness does not itself participate in anything whatever. It is a, just a permanent background of all the activities. You can say, if you like, that everything, every percept is inside consciousness. The consciousness itself is not of them, but they are of it. They are like the ripples on the sea. Ripples can fall down and leave the sea there calm. You can imagine the sea calm without any ripples, but you can't imagine the ripples without the sea, which establishes the priority of substance, doesn't it? This substance, he would say, is the thing which stands stands under, so, so it's the understanding, it's the thing that stand un, stands under all the forms and which it pulls them together, sees the meaning in the relationship between them. So the substance is literally, we tend to think of this as the material which is having the experiences, which is not a bad way of thinking of it, but if we think of it as the thing which is standing underneath all of these ripples, supporting every possible <coughs> image. The great one which I think Halliday invented is to say, well, it's like the white paper because it allows um, idiots like me to draw all over it and it supports all of those completely, but it isn't actually any of them. And yet without them, it would be very, very difficult to get a, to hold um, a form for you to see. So it supports all of that. And I always think, it, it always reminds me of, of Zen painting and Chan painting when you see that the artist leaves a hell of a lot of white paper and the picture just slowly seems to emerge out of it and because of the copious amounts of water that they use it sort of blends back into the paper beautifully. So that, if you like, it's making a direct reference to the fact that whatever you're looking at, this branch, this twig, this bird singing or whatever, is actually emerging out of this background of silent stillness, which is the consciousness itself. So you're looking at it, it's being <clears throat> captured in the painting, if you'd like to think of it like that. It is well to make a... If we draw ourselves a wave and the body of water, we can say that the body of water represents substance, plastic substance, and these waves <clears throat> are now the basis of the possibility of counting. If we draw another, another body of water here, calm, we can say that, that it's one surface, don't, don't we? Because it's flat. So in other words, that's one type of sea. We can imagine one which is very calm. And we would say this is one surface, just like that. At the moment the waves come in, we can, we can start counting the waves. Here there are one, 
two, three, etc., four, and so on. This is like the tooth side of a saw. So you can imagine that's the top of, this, of the saw tooth. <coughs> And we call this the discrete aspect. Discrete means grown apart. This is a discrete aspect of the phenomenal world. Here's the substantial world. This is the one here, just the body. And when it's got waves on it, we can say it's discrete because these things are separated out. They've been distinctly separated. Discrete means grown apart. This is a discrete aspect of the phenomenal world. There is the substantial world, whatever it might be, all this stuff. You can call it in good old Saxon, so stuff is the Saxon word. This is the materia of the Latins, the, the stuff substance, the xyla, or wood of the Greeks. And this is the carving of the wood, or the rippling of the plastic substance. Here we have a continuity, here we have the continuity on the bottom. So I think he's probably drawing, he used to draw a saw for me, and say, if you've got a saw like that, and you've got the body of the saw, you can imagine the teeth, you can count the teeth, etc., but you can't imagine them being there without the body of the saw. So it's the saw which is supporting all that shape there, all that form, and that this is the important part here. This is the thing that guides the saw and directs it into in its cutting. You're very aware of this. We were cutting very wet timber today, uh, my dear wife and I, weren't we? We were. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was that wet that I got my coarsest tooth saw, and it's still bound. It's still trapped inside the saw, so it's split. So, um, just shows you. The body of this is an important aspect, particularly if you're cutting wet timber. <laughs> Ships may pitch, pitch and toss, and the sailors may complain up here as much as they like. I don't know how your diagrams come out. John did attempt to... What I do is I shrink John's transcripts down, so we've got it down to 19 pages. The original one is, is about uh, at least a third again, as big as that. But in thinning it down, the diagrams get extremely thin lines, so you have to try hard to see them. But what he's drawn there is actually some ship uh, uh, amongst the waves in serious torment. I don't think it's going to get, out to get through that next wave, especially in full sail as it is. But, um, and of course one on the bottom. <coughs> Ships may pitch and toss, the sailors may complain, complain up here as much as they like, the ones who are being tossed around by the sea. Down below, a sunken ship is, calm, in, is in calmness, isn't it? Now this is very, very similar to the human mind. The ripples in the human mind are caused by forces acting on the mind from outside, which we call stimuli. The depth of the mind. The stimulus from outside cannot produce great disturbances. Sorry, can pre cannot produce great disturbances, which means that fundamentally everybody is quite, quite calm. <laughs> this is what Patanjali to, uses to describe the mind when he's talking about meditation. He's saying it's the stimuli and the thought forms from captured stimuli inside the mind which disturb and give us all the trauma, trauma and chaos of the storms inside our heads. But the deeper <coughs> inside that we go, the more we withdraw from the surface world the more we find calm and stillness, and the more we find meaning and understanding. In yoga, it's very important to, to recognize that you don't get understanding by thinking a lot, or going to college, or reading books. You get understanding by going inside. And that's why it's called wisdom rather than cleverness. The distinction between the two is, you can have an awful lot of forms, but unless you understand how to put them together, you don't have any real mm -hmm. meaning in your life. And Halliday would often say, if you get too much learning without any understanding, it scatters you, it fragments you. It's very, very difficult to pull it together. Particularly people who span two or three different subjects. Our society is particularly poor in linking subjects together. So, you know, there are, there are, there are real problems um, in trying to unify our thinking. During the, the 14th century, in Italy particularly, the idea was to be a complete being, to understand all the areas of science and art, and to pull them together inside your awareness so that you could talk about anything, and you could see how they all link together. Now, nowadays, that would be impossible. Nobody would take, uh, you know, um, anybody trying to, to get the, that sort of great span of intelligence, 
because the the amount of detail, the amount of of, of sort of um, information which is gathered in all in all areas has been has risen exponentially. The vast number of vast number of subjects, never mind the the information in the subjects. So this idea about literally understanding and pulling <coughs> things together is a very important one. Now Patanjali and Halliday are saying here in the same sense that it isn't a great deal of ideas that you need, it's literally the understanding which comes from literally being substantial, going into that consciousness. So one of the concepts which he's, which he's giving over here, which is very important, is we tend to think of substance as the Greeks did, you know, the sense of what is the world made out of. The whole <coughs> idea of atoms was thrown up by the Greeks trying to work out what, it, what is it that could possibly make liquids, gases, solid stuff like earth, trees, human beings. What is it that could make them all? And that's just what when they start to postulate the idea of the atom, which is the final thing that everything's made out of. Halliday is suggest, suggesting here, along with the, the whole roots of, of Indian and I would say Eastern metaphysics, that consciousness is the thing that everything is made out of. And the co consciousness is the fabric, the thing which stands underneath all the other forms, every other thing and every other thing inside of it. And there's a little aside here which I don't know what it refers to. Um, and when you listen to it on the thing, I think it's how they're just talking to somebody who's um, trying to, uh, to switch a gas fire on or something. Anyhow, the question of assimilation now. We know that unless a substance has some factor identical with another substance, it cannot fuse with it. Now suppose we consider that all matter is vibrating in a certain way. So in other words, all we call matter all we call form and shapes is a vibration of a particular type. So everything is a vibration of a particular type. So when I said you have a perception, you perceive, you grab hold of one of the vibrations that are coming at you, whether it's through your eyeballs, you know, the, um, light waves, or through your ears, sound waves, etc. Whether you're actually picking up the waveforms which are uh, uh, represented in, representing themselves as, se as scent or smell or taste, whatever, to your brain. All these, if you like, are vibrational systems which are coming to you, which you're analyzing the world outside, in other you're grabbing it and breaking it and trying to focus on it. Now, supposing we could, all matter is vibrating in a certain way, and we can, if we like, we can say, if we like, that some matter has a characteristic waveform like that, and it's baseline from which it starts. So we can say that he's talking now about vibrations. And there's a baseline that runs through them. <clears throat> so when we count vibrations, we count from the to the as one whole wave. I like to think of it as a circle which has been separated out in time. In other words, it's a circle which has been pushed through time. So the vibration there is actually a round which is rolled, if you like, it's almost like the Loki of a, of a rolling circle. And we're talking about the same thing which he would say is like that, only we're, we're spreading it out here. And then it goes on and makes another one, of course, so there's been this vibrational rate. And we, we have here, this is the, these are the nodes, <coughs> and these are the anti-nodes. I'll just put anti. So you've got the, the points, and this is the baseline across uh, above which and below which they vibrate. This is the sound of the vibrations. It's all vibration, because light is a vibration as well. Oh right, yes. So all information, if you like, comes it comes at us in some vibrating form. Right. Is what yes. he's saying. Yes. And we perceive it. We actually read its character from the frequency and the amplitude and the wavelength, etc. The whole, all of that has a characteristic which we read. But we can only read a, a limited amount of them with our senses, but we know that the, the world itself is rich in all sorts of vibrational forms. Right. So 
So it isn't just sound. It's not a sound. It isn't just sound. Well, it's not it just is sound. sound, but it isn't just oh, sound. Oh, right, it is sound, but yeah. not just sound. Not just sound. Right, no. that's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> what he's actually saying is that even things like chemistry actually comes down to vibrations as mm. well. The very beats of the, um, of the electrons and uh, all the different particles inside the atom are recognised by their vibrational rates and the, what they actually, how they form themselves in that, along those lines. So, when he's talking about that, that's literally the same thing as we were saying before about all energy coming at us in a vibrational way. Now, supposing we take the string of a musical instrument, which is how Pythagoras would have done it, and we allow the string to vibrate, supposing we pull it down here and let it fly across, let it fly across, it will then assume this position and then that position. So what he's saying is, okay, and I'm going to take that, this is any wave form at all, or, or you know, any particular size or frequency. I'm going to take this bit here, because he's just going to say, okay, imagine a stringed instrument, and you've got the nut at one end, that's not the person who's playing it, that's a particular thing that holds the string up here. And you've got the string stretched, it's like a bass line, and then when you pluck it, it vibrates like that. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating the rate at <coughs> which it vibrates, but can you see that? Mm -hmm. Does everybody agree that's a wonderful drawing of a vibrating string? <laughs> okay. Remember, you have to acknowledge the government is interesting because I spent four years doing art college, so it has to be recognised. So it vibrates between those and right. So. That's, once it does that, we can actually not just hear the sound, we can actually measure it, we can qualify it, and we can talk about its qualities. Now, <clears throat> Pythagoras, Pythagoras was interested in this because he saw all number as being rooted in vibration. All number as being significantly formed like sound was. Don't forget the Greeks were the ones who first categorized all the, the scales and things that we understand and developed most of the instruments as well. So it's flying from one to the other. So we've given it a push that starts it moving and it's vibrating like that. So why music is closely associated with maths? It's one of the reasons it's closely associated mm -hmm. with maths. It's also because, because of the, the, it, it's constructed on patterns as well which are mathematical. But um, I think you'll find this bit particularly fascinating because I did, mm -hmm. and um, it, it, it does actually link it in and make it, well, I, I would say, slightly more understandable why it is so complete. Okay, let's see, it's good, just get down what he's talking about at this point. So it's flying from one extreme to the other, and it will give a beat we call the fundamental. Now. <coughs> If that's a string vibrating, that's the deepest sound it can get. Now, in terms of science, which is really, really interesting here, they an analyze that on a stringed instrument, and they say, actually, if that's the vibrational height, and that is the un- seen but still that's the whole wave can you see that yes. now you've got the nuts here and you've got the um the bridge here but you've, you've you've got literally you're only seeing half the vibrational rate of the wave not the string yeah. exhibit a I hesitate to do this with so many string players in the room, but <laughs> why I brought this is because it's relatively easy to demonstrate a few things on it. And I'm not going to offend anybody's ear because I doubt if you'll hear it. But what you can easily do is measure it. Okay? <clears throat> so you have here a string. 
And the thing about strings are, and the things about music itself and tone is that you're making a sound, you're making a vibration which has a unity. It, it has, it will vibrate between those two positions with a standing wave. Because of the unity of this particular thing, or the unity of a bell, or the unity of a tube, we can get one so a sound out of it, which is a standing wave. In other words, it's not broken by all sorts of different substances. If we, we get a stick, for instance, which is all sorts of different thicknesses and length, sorry, widths of, of you know, whatever, the branches sticking out, and we pull it, it will make a note, but it won't make a consistent standing wave because the materials are not tuned properly, they're not, they don't give a proper resonance, so it's, it's vibrating all over the place in different ways, and it won't hold to a thing, it will change quickly. So it makes what we would call a noise. It doesn't make a note. Now this thing, because of the way it's produced, and so, it, like a bell for instance, you can get a piece of metal, which isn't sound, and you can hit it, it can go clunk. It hasn't got unity and it hasn't got a resonance fact to, to make a note, it's making a noise. And the difference between the sound of a note and a noise, we could say, is the fact that it, with making a standing wave, it has a unity, so it actually makes a tunable thing and it holds that note. We can hear it until it fades away. <coughs> okay. Now, I only found this out a short time ago when I was trying to work, it, work out what they were talking about. That is the string and the whole of it is vibrating, but the wave of that fundamental is actually twice as long as that because, if you like, that's what the string is doing, it's going up and down. But while it's going up, the waveform, which has left and is going round the room, is actually completing that motion. And so, as this is going down and up and down and up, the wave is actually passing out and along, and we're picking it up. And the sound of it is actually twice that length. Okay? Does that make sense? Because that's hard to see. But you have to imagine that this is the center of a large <coughs> circle, and that the fundamental is the diameter and this is just the radius, okay? So we're making half the sound, literally, as that goes out. And then you'll be able to understand then, and I have exhibits here, that these little dots have been magically placed where standing waves also are easy to, to get, to hold. Now, because the thing is tuned, it will always do its best to make a standing wave. But if you can imagine the full width of it, that looks as if it's actually halfway. Okay, so that's the octave here. The thickness of the strings are what make the different the different gauges actually make the, the height and the the, uh, the density of the sound frequency that we hear as different pitch, but. If I literally just, can you hear a little competition? <laughs> <coughs> you might just be able to hear. Can you hear it dividing itself into two halves? It's not the same as, as that. But mm -hmm. well, the octave here is actually a quarter of the full wave of sound. It's a quarter of that, and. You can hear it. I'm not pressing it down onto the fret. It's just the string vibrating of itself. That's the easiest one for me to find on here because, of course, it's the perfect middle. And to try and show you that it is literally the perfect middle, this face is 30 inches long. And that fret is placed perfectly here on 15 inches. <laughs> The other ones which you can uh, obviously, obviously understand, this one is on 10 inches, so that's a third of this string, or a sixth of the full wave. 
Tom, I know there's these, these stringed instrument people are all looking at me here when I'm, I'm talking this stuff. I know this will be bread and butter to you guys, but it's quite revealing when you actually see it, you see it shown like this, you know. So that the, um, the five inch point here, which fits into this thing six times, is actually a twelfth of the fundamental note. Now the fundamental note contains all of these little ones inside it. So you can hear them and you literally, you're resonating, you're making them resonate. I literally by as you as you pluck and fret this in particular places, so you're finding literally the pitch you, that you've got has a deeper resonance with other fundamental notes inside it, and with other instruments as well. If there were other instruments in the room, and I was to pluck a particular note, for instance, this one's A. The A strings and all of the fiddles in the in the place would, if we could get close to them, would be resonating with it because of the pitch of it there would be the same pitch for them. Similarly, this thing here <coughs> resonates at the same A, twice as, twice as fast on the octave. So it is a geometrical division. It doesn't look like it. And for a long time, I looked at these things and thought all the business was going on here. But actually, you're playing partials of a full string, which are, again, half of the, of the full wavelength that you're actually hearing. So in that sense, the assimilation that we hear and the tunefulness of this is because these are all whole number partials of the big fundamental. So when I play here, I'm playing a quarter of it. When I play here, I'm playing a sixth of the, a third of the string or a sixth of the big one. When I play this one here, that one is, is at, um, two and a half inches, so that's a twenty-fourth of the big one, a twelfth of this one particularly here. And they resonate together because geometrically, the standing wave supported, <coughs> that is supported by this is all part of this whole. So the geometry of that fits in with literally what we can hear. And we can hear that unity and the strength of that particular sound when we recognize a note. Does that make sense to everyone? <laughs> Yeah. Any questions about my ham-fisted description of this, or any string into string paper, or anybody who would like to add a bit more to that? Yeah, well, the notes, the notes are like just a, a brass instrument without any keys. Yeah. And it's playing a column of that, mm -hmm. and it's getting each of those partial vibrations. That's the typical brass fanfare notes. Yeah, that's right. And so, and similarly with those, when we go up, then they, they just take. You see the scales for us in, in that sense. The, the fret is about 16 inches, so how far is the, the fundament? Sorry? The fret is about 16 inches, so how far is the fundament? How far does it extend? The fundamental, well this one is 30 inches. Oh, 30 inches. This one's 30 inches. <coughs> so, the mathematics of that would be, the, the wavelength would be 60 inches long. Right, so it's yeah. And the ratio of the frequency to the to the to the speed, because all these things are vibrate at the right at the, the, the geometry governs the speed at which they actually vibrate. So you can work out the frequency of vibration by literally the length of the string, the thick the thickness of the gauge, etc. I don't I can't remember the formula, but I was looking at it only the other day. And it is quite remarkable that you know just purely by that you can work out not just the frequency, but what the node should be. Um, so that's, again, all part of this. And what fascinated people like Pythagoras was that this seems to be some form of, if you like, small demonstration of what unity could <coughs> possibly be in the material world. <coughs> because to speak about assimilation means this and this string can accommodate all these different waveforms, and if you plug it here, for instance, you're going to get that is one twenty-fourth. I'm actually fretting there of the full vibration. So I'm creating waveforms along here, which are harmonic with that, and which will res resonate with it, and tuned with it, so that we find that they harmonise, although they are different. We can hear the difference, but we can also hear that they fit together. The fitting togetherness means assimilation. And people like Pythagoras and Plato <laughs> would say that's the sort of assimilation and fitting togetherness which the universe must have in itself. 
to the degree that they would say even the, the planets are tuned in the same same ratios of that. And there is a thing called Bode's Law, if you want to look it up, where he, to within, you know, a couple of thousand miles, he'd organized where the planets necessarily had to be in the solar system. It works for the first seven, first six, sorry, it doesn't work for the ones beyond that. They're way, way off. But it pretty well organizes it. And I remember <coughs> Halliday saying, what happens with the universe is because you've got the sun at one end, and you've got the outer reaches, and the, he'd say the, and the vibrational rate of this particular sonic system that they thought, literally, because these nodes are still points, they're not moving, <coughs> that was where you would accumulate matter. <coughs> if you get a Cladney um, disc, which a Cladney disc is literally a sheet of metal, and you bow it with a violin bow and sprinkle salt on it, the salt tends to move into patterns. It moves into the places where the, the plate is not vibrating. And it makes up patterns <coughs> across this plate so that you can see the different shapes and things which the sound creates by its vibration. Mm. By the still points is where the salt or the sand or the whatever dust you've got there will literally stick to. I don't know whether you've ever seen, you've see, ever seen those on. I was going to, to do it a few years ago and I decided not to because there is, there is something now uh, called cornstarch. If you go on YouTube and put on cornstarch, put in cornstarch vibrations, you will see the most incredible <laughs> things. What they do is they have a speaker, literally like a um, standard stereo speaker. They lay it down on its back, so it's, 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 up, it's facing upwards. They put a, a, a cloth on it and they put cornstarch on in it, which is custard, American for custard. Um, <coughs> And they put different tones through the speaker. And it's not just like sand. The cornstarch is called um, a non-Newtonian material. <coughs> didn't know this about custard. I knew it was magical custard, but I didn't know why it was magical. Oh, thank you. The, the damn things makes fingers. It, the, damn, the thing starts to dance. It is yeah. absolutely incredible. And you would not believe what they can get the cornstarch to do. Yeah, watch Big Bang Theory, they do it on there. Do they do it on there? Yeah, they put um, <coughs> cling film over the speaker. And then it's, it's just, it, all it is, it's just cornstarch and water. Yeah. It's mixed together. And they put it on there and they all sit around and watch it because they're all like geeks. Yeah. But it is, yeah. I sit and watch it on YouTube, it's very good. I love it, yeah. Sometimes it can be demonic, actually, because yeah. they, they almost make up sort of human-type forms, you know, yeah. they look, <laughs> you see these sort of figures sort of hunched up out of the, out of the custard. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Magic stuff, custard, apparently uh, you can swim in it, and you can also run across it if you're very fast. Mm. <laughs> Amazing stuff, yeah. At one time, I think I was partially made of this, but it's all past now, all behind me now. Right, so. Okay, so if we stimulate this, uh, where was I? Now, if we allow the string to vibrate, suppose we pull it down here and let it fly across, it will assume this position and then that position, flying from one extreme to the other, won't it? And it will give a beat that we call the fundamental. But if the fundamental is the longest one that you can get, literally between the two fixed ends, um, and as she was just saying, some instruments don't have a fixed end, so you, you, you have to usually blow across the top of it to try and get the note, the vibration column of air inside it. It's still governed by the pipe, if you like, that you're in, whether it's a flute or whatever. Um, the pipe itself governs <coughs> the sorts of standing, standing waves you can get in it. In other words, the notes and the, the, the amount of tunefulness that you can actually get from that particular piece of metal or whatever it is. And if you notice, all the instruments are, are different ways of getting long lengths and short lengths into an area which somebody can actually play by altering the, the, the amount of length. And the stops 
either on a saxophone or a, or a trumpet or whatever, like somebody pressing a guitar or, or, or pressing the string on a fiddle, are ways of shortening and lengthening the standing, the, the, the allowance for the standing waves to get to me. And the, the scales and the harmonic sounds are the ones literally which make simple numbers, simple number divisions of the fundamental. But if we stimulate the string in various ways, plucking it, a wave will break through the middle there. You can put a finger here on a violin string and we will then get, if that finger is halfway from there to here, we'll get an octave of this fundamental note. That means if the fundamental is, say, middle C on the piano, <coughs> then putting the finger halfway along it would give you the C above it, which has double the frequency. Which means if we take this character, we can reproduce it here and say that the wavelength of that is half as long as that. But the frequency is double. So what he's saying is, that, is if you literally, as I went on to the, to the octave there, and reduced the length of the string by half, I'm doubling the speed at which it vibrates. Since, you know, those two things um, are rising in inverse proportion. This question of assimilation is very closely linked because, in effect, it means that if we take the universe itself as a big sphere, I'll take the diameter, dynamic, diameter of it as the fundamental, okay? So he's now going to say, well, if we take the universe and the diameter is the great fundamental across there, then we've got this standing, we can imagine this standing wave. It would have a note. When it talk, used to talk about the, the music of the spheres, they actually considered that the, the universe was a, a network of concentric spheres. <coughs> Literally, at different nodal points, there would be a sphere which was humming a particular note, so that all of them sang together, you could say. So, I'll start again. So, we could, I'm about just close to the bottom of page, page two. So, we could then make a gamut of waves. The longest wave, the full diameter of the universe, and, and the shortest, shortest wave would be like Schrodinger's wavicle somewhere on the other side of the electron. A very, very tiny wave. All these things being waves, they're all particular frequencies. There are many of those per second of time. I think. I'm not wrong, he said at one time that the piccolo was something like about 4,000 vibrations a second and that the lowest note you could get on a big bass was in the region of about 400 um, and it's very close to when it stops being a sound and starts being individual beats. You know, when, when it gets so low you can hear it as a beat. You can hear it, it the vibration. You can actually pick them up as separate. On an organ sometimes, it's a big cathedral organ. Yeah. Very big low pipes. That's right. And it can actually become painful to your ears at a certain point because you feel it as, as, as impacts, you know. But so can piccolo at the other range. You know, it can, it can be so tight that it'll actually just penetrate and really hurt your ear. So we, we do pick these, these vibrations up and there's a range of which beyond which we cannot hear. Of course, dogs can hear much higher than <coughs> Sorry, I jumped a bit, haven't I? Yes, Excuse yes, me, yes. I did. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'll go back to that. I missed out the whole paragraph. Um, the yeah, this question of assimilation is very closely linked. Because <coughs> in effect, it means that if we take the universe itself a big sphere, and I'll take the diameter of it as the fundamental, then we can say there is a definite vibration which, to the appropriate tympanum, to the appropriate sensitive organ, say the divine ear, would sound the fundamental. And then if we divided it in the middle, and stop it here, it would be an octave higher, sounding there would, um, would be on both sides, which we could call more musically a partial. So there's a fundamental, and it's made of partials, just like that bass string was I showed you just before. 
And if we stopped it again at this half here, this would be an octave higher again, which is what we did. Remember we said that was the days, and we've got the, the, the great fundamental, which is not as big as the universe, but it's, it's getting there. Half an octave higher still. And this is going up to smaller and smaller divisions. And we can see that the wavelengths of these parts are getting shorter. So we can then say if we take this as the whole universe, this is the dynamometer of it, and then proceed to subdivide it until we can no longer divide it anymore, we've reached the shortest wave in the universe. In other words, we can keep on subdividing, and what we're getting is tiny, tiny wavelengths. And what happens, of course, is <coughs> these tiny wavelengths are sometimes carried on larger carrying waves. So even the waves themselves have got waves inside them. So these structures are very complex indeed and can be built up wave upon wave upon wave. And obviously even those again can be carrying them. So what they're saying is in this sound universe, if you like, this vibrational universe, and we're, we're using sound as a reference for all forms of wavelength, we could say you can tune in to the whole sound of the universe by playing playing partials of the great fundamental. <coughs> so this here is capable of resonating with, although obviously much faster and much shorter frequency, the great universal vibration that the universe or the world or the this particular neck of the woods that we have. Um, is vibrating with. So we could then make a gamut of waves, the longest wave, which would be the diameter of the universe, and the shortest wave would be something like Schrodinger's wavicle, somewhere on the other side of the electron. A very, very <coughs> tiny wave, very short wave of very high frequency. There are many of those per second of time. So supposing we say that we make some food, we'll draw a circle here, will say food is just something that can be assimilated. You see, the difference between the word food and good is G and F, isn't it? Now this concept, ood, or ad, id, means to eat, in the root of edible. The Sanskrit ad is also the same thing, ud. You say food, food. Now good means the gross matter of food. So we say we get something, is it good for you? You put it inside, then send it down there, break it up, and if you can assimilate it and come out better, you call it good. But if instead of being able to assimilate it, it starts disrupting you, you call it a poison. Or curry. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> In other words, that this assimilation is to do literally with whether or not your vibration, if you like, can tolerate the vibration which is in the chemistry or in the foodstuff, the structure of it perhaps, and the way that, you're, that it, it reacts with you. So we can see that this circle can be assimilated by this big one because it's half the fundamental. So what he's saying now is, we can imagine that that is, imagine that was a circle, <coughs> and these circles on these octaves are all actually easily assimilable to this big one. They're all easily sorted out because they are geometrically partials of it. And so easy to understand, to comprehend in that sense, to literally vibrate with as well. <coughs> Does that part make sense about the food and the good? Okay, a simple way of looking at it. So we can see that the circle can be assimilated by this big one because it's half the fundamental. So it has a natural resonance, doesn't it? And we would say that there's one, there's another one in here that we can assimilate by this one, and halfway there's another one, and then there's another one. And there's another one. You can see that all these small frequencies can be absorbed by the big one, can't they? But if we go on cutting these down in this map, we'll find that some of them will not assimilate with each other because of the relation between odd and even counts. When we cut that, we get 2. If we could have given 4, 8, 16. We haven't got something yet that can be di divided by 3, have we? See that? Now, if we go on up and up and up, we'll find that the odd numbers will not assimilate with the even. Now, you know Pythagoras said odd numbers are male, which means that they're active. 
Even numbers are balanced, equilibrated, and therefore female. The number five, he said, means marriage because it contains two and three. The female number two is the same as passivity, and the odd number is a stimulus. There's an odd one in three. One itself is not odd. It's the whole that we begin with. You see that? The funny thing about elementary arithmetic is that the behavior of one and two are not like the behavior of all of the numbers. We say plus one equals we say one plus one equals two, and two times one is two. So whether you add or multiply one, you get the same result. Don't you? But if we take the number two, we say two times two are four, and two plus two are four. You see? And that behaves like one, doesn't it? The same result whether you add or multiply. But when we come to number three, if you say three plus three are six and three times three are nine, so suddenly there's a new emergent. And therefore there's a special kind of mathematics for dealing with the peculiar behavior of one and two. So one and two must be considered as first this big one, the one, the whole one, and all these are parts. Now the word part itself is a rational cut, a pi rut. And that pi ratio is the function. You see, there's the radius, and this is a part <coughs> of it. The part, the para, bird, is so called because it says things parot, <coughs> rationally rotating. Then whatever you feed in, it plays back. So, you see, these are all divisible, <coughs> these are all partials which have divided that string by, in two. In two again, and in two again, and in two again, and two again, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But then you could, we could also divide that uh, into thirds, in which case we'll get some which don't mutually accept each other, because their divisions are not in tune with the others. So here we get keys and things in, in terms of music, where you have to shift all your measurements across, and you'll then get various things sounding in tune with and the other thing sounding not in tune with are the sound. Because you can divide this into thirds if you like, you can divide it into fifths, and that again would not would resonate with the, with the fundamental, but two partials wouldn't actually get on together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> they would all be part of that great big sounding note there, but they wouldn't resonate together, and this one, when it's vibrated, wouldn't cause the other ones to vibrate as well, because they're not geometrically simply relatable to each other, although they are all related by the fundamental. So the fundamental subsumes them all, it wraps them all up and can tolerate them all and vibrate with them, because it contains them in all its possible vibrations. But each partial might not get on together. And then that last part is saying that literally one and two have to be taken as being completely unique because one represents the whole and two represents the first division of it. And that gives us our pi ratio, which he says is the essence of all logic in that everything in the universe is the description of what happens to a circle in terms of the amount of push that comes out of the center. And that that is literally the pi ratio of which all the rationality of that particular world, that particular circle, is governed by the relationship of the diameter, sorry, the radius in that particular case, to the circumference, or the diameter itself is the great <coughs> fundamental. Does that make sense? Okay. We've got time to stop and discuss it if someone is, is caught on because what he's going to go on and say is that this is why the universe is accessible to us as human beings because we can resonate with it. We can tune ourselves literally if we choose to to resonate with all the partials but that's more difficult. That, that is in, in many senses very difficult for us to do. But the fundamental is actually flowing through us, and we are literally a part of it. We are a resonance part of that great fundamental sound of the universe. <coughs> what frequency is the fundamental sound? Of the universe? Mm. I don't know, but it's supposed to resonate with, with, as far as the Hindus are concerned, with that great sound, oh, 
and that if you, if that's what the human, that's the human approximation to the sound that the universe makes as it buzzes along. Um, it's as good as any, I suppose, in that sense. But um, it, it's not a, it's not a st solidly held thing because it actually goes deeper. If you hear them do it, it goes very deep, and then it goes very high. So it seems to go through all, if you like, the full um, body resonation of a human being. It's using like, us as a, as a, if you like, a tuning tube, like one of those notations, because it starts quite, quite balanced. And it goes down as deep as it can, and then it goes really quite high, and becomes very nasal if you hear them do it properly. Um, so, it, how that could be the fundamental sound, I don't know. But certainly, we should be able to um, make a sound which is well. I, we can't make a sound which isn't in keeping with that universal structure because all of us are tiny particles of that. But we should be able to tune ourselves, if you like, so we can assimilate and work along with it is the theory behind all of these and that it, you know that would pythagoras would be completely in in, in in tune with that all the whole idea of studying the mathematics of the universe is to see how the divisions how these relationships can be formulated to understand how we can subsume things in the right categories and how we can organize ourselves so that we are very <coughs> saying that the word part <coughs> is literally that pi rat it comes from that part here. He's saying it's part of that ratio of understanding, <coughs> and that even the parrot is is called that there because it says things par rote. In other words, it rotates to see what you get and gives it right back to you, un unaltered. If we keep cutting this two and two, we will always find that this half can be assimilated by this and this and this. But when we divide it in three, we get a note that, that which in music is called a fifth. Strange that we should call it a fifth when it's really a third of the length of the string. But there is a way of reconciling that. But the point is that the third will not vibrate harmoniously with that half, so that it cannot be assimilated by it. But if we take factors of odd and even numbers and build them up, we can arrive at a number that can assimilate both odd and even, can't we? So he's saying that the great fundamental can assimilate all these things. <coughs> On this, we said that that's the halfway point. But this here is dividing it into three. And that note does not assimilate well to that one. We can, we can use it together, but it isn't, it doesn't mathematically fit together until you get to much larger numbers which can swallow the, the, the divisions of, of three and six, which he's going to go on to in just a moment. Right. So well supposing we take three fives. Now that will assimilate two odd numbers, won't it? Three and five. If we take three fours, it assimilates an even number and an odd number. So there's something mysterious about 12, isn't there? Because it can assimilate an odd and an even number. We're excluding one and two because they're special cases. The reason why they're special cases is this one, one inside, and one outside. So they're the two well, the special cases, the first division. One outside is infinite. And the one inside is finite. So one and two are very, very special cases. But from the point of three onwards, the first synthetic number, one isn't synthetic, it's unanalyzed. The first synthetic number is three. And the next is four. And three times four is twelve. So in twelve we have a means of assimilating short frequencies derived from the third and from the half. You can cut the half into half, quarters, eight sixteenths and the third into sixth, twelfths, and so on. So this question of the fundamental beat of matter is very important. If we wanted to, we could cut that into 13 times 7 plus 1, which would give us the atomic scale, namely 92 elements, ignoring isotopes for the time being. When we come down to the smallest particle, it's a definite subdivision of the diameter of the universe, which means to say that it has a definite resonance relationship with other parts of the universe. That means that there is something in man, namely his physical body, 
which is made of the earth, which is made of primary elements vibrating at definite wavelengths, which are necessarily related to the planetary cycle, the whole mass of matter in the solar system, and to an octave structure, the sun itself, and then to the sidereal system, and then to the whole universe. I told you, it's pretty big, this idea, you know? You can't get much bigger than that. So that then matter is no more than a series of subdivisions right down to the smallest <coughs> subatomic particle there is, which has a definite periodistic function, a definite frequency of its own, and a wavelength. And the whole question of assimilation, therefore, is fundamentally one of frequency. <coughs> right. Can I just ask? I'm just Please. trying to put something in perspective for me, really. That in these days we sort of live in a decimalised world, you know, yep. based on naught and ten. And, and here we are, going back to sixteenths and eighths and so on. Does this mean to say that the, everything that we are experiencing today with computers and decimalisation is out of sync with the universe? And this is really the sound of the maths. This is the maths of the universe. Well, when they actually formed the metric system, it was formed, I think it was by Napoleon's mathematician, wasn't it? And he said it was the division of the, of the circumference of the Earth. So it was trying to get back, fit along with these sort of things, but he set it at a particular number, and then the actual meter is something like um, uh, 100 thousandths of that. So he was still trying to form some sort of universal uh, measuring device. It's difficult with tens to manipulate in the same way as 12. 12, as Eugene has just pointed out, divide easily. Um, and I, I it, this, it, this bass guitar was made in America, so they still use feet and inches over there, which is quite, quite fascinating. And in terms of carpentry work, if you're doing any geometry, it's easier with, with, with feet and inches, as far as I'm concerned. Because usually you're dividing in the middle, or you want to put something in thirds or sixths or something, and it works, it, it, it works easily. Without going down to points and, and, and things like that, you can usually divide it up. And of course, the Greeks used to not use measurement particularly. They used to measure with a compass, so it was easier to divide things into sixths and thirds and with dividers. They were all, if you go through um, Euclid, it never is, is, is measurement never, um, mentioned. Because if it's a universal system, then it works at any size. You're talking about a proportion. And proportionally speaking, as far as Plato was concerned, the universe is built on proportional structures. The measurement is, is, is um, irrelevant. So to how do we get sort of seven days and 12 months and 365 days and not 10 days, 10 day weeks and things like that? Well, literally because the year as we divide it is, is formed of, um, it's a fixed so so right? <coughs> it must have taken a long time to work out. It was 365 and a quarter, and I think it's four minutes or something like that uh, long. Um, and we know for a fact that at one time our calendar was so out of sync that we were getting snow in October and stuff. So they had to readjust it with the Julian calendar. So it's actually based literally on a division of the great circle of the Earth circulating. And that is, is separated into the amount of spinning that, that, it, that it does. And we came at it through trial and error to get it as right as we possibly could. It's fascinating to see that there are different forms which are written into the great monuments of the world uh, where they seem to have recognized <coughs> the fact and they seem to have been able to measure these things long before we understood how, they, you know, how, how it was formed, for instance. So that the ephemeris that the Babylonians drew up about the movements of the planets were still used by astrologers. The Babylonian ones were used until about 1780. It's only then that we started to come in with modern methods of analysis of it. But all those calendar movements, all those measurements of time, are all done literally by these, the solar bodies. They have to be, really, if they're going to be repeated. It's, it's a standing wave. If all law... When Eugene says the logic of it is literally how this great log rolls, the divisions of it 
are literally what the Earth travels through in the big rotation around the Sun. So when I said Bode's law was about the fact that this is actually a sonic structure and that the orbits of those planets, Bode's law predicts as being literally along like a tuned string. So that he's, they're actually saying that, yes, there is a, that particular wave of vibration we know now is 365 days long. It took a long time to, to sort of form that out. But that governs literally the number of, of the weeks and days that we get because of the we're measuring them by the rotation of the Earth. So as it goes round, it's 365 and a quarter spins we get through in, from going right the way round. And to do that, we have to <coughs> measure ourselves against the great clock of the universe, which is the zodiac belt. The zodiac belt of stars is a belt around the midpoint. Our solar system is really convenient because it's fairly, the planets are fairly well in the line. Not quite, but fairly well in the line. And if you look past them to the star systems behind them, you see a belt of stars, which they call the zodiac, because the zoo part of that means they were named after animals. That's all it means. And they used that and divided it up into 12 zones to get the year because you can divide a, a circle easily by six and then take the midpoint and do it six again you get 12 very easily again it's a proportional thing and then they could then measure where the sun was because <coughs> if you're over here you're seeing the sun in Capricorn <coughs> so you would say okay it tends to snow when the sun is in Capricorn. Yeah. <laughs> Every year. So then you've got a calendar, something to work out. And when the sun, you know, is in Cancer, so we're over here, we're seeing the sun in Cancer, it tends to be warm. And those flower things come up and pop around. So we get an organization in time wise of the universe that we're flowing through. And this zodiac is then like a big clock for us to measure ourselves against. It's the sidereal system, which is beyond our solar system. But we can see it, and we can use it as the big guidance thing. And then all these are just subdivisions, literally, of the great year. So that when I came back from, un from university and I was talking to Eugene, he said, did you get your degree? And I said, yeah. He says, okay. So you've got one 360th of what the world is made of. <laughs> you've got one degree. <laughs> That's it, you know. Well, he says, there's an awful lot more to do. <laughs> but that's it. We've got what the ancients used to say is 360 proper days and five holy days, which are not in time. Because they had to try and accommodate the fact that you couldn't, you didn't get the right number of days in that full year. So God had obviously made a mistake. He hadn't calculated <coughs> properly. It was spinning just too fast. It should be slightly slower. And of course, it does wobble a little bit on its axis. <coughs> so that's why we divide proportionally, <coughs> and that's why most time is measured in twelfths, of it's twelve hours or whatever. And it's usually we measure it by something that circulates because it's easier to contain it. But if you put that Kirkland circulate, that literally, that circulation, you can see what is, what's actually happen, happening in time. If we push that through time, we're going up and down, aren't we? Up and down. So we've got a vibrational thing. Does that make sense to you? Everyone mm -hmm. really see that? <coughs> so the, <coughs> that going round, is an eternal view of what is actually doing this in time. So that vibration is a time measurement of something which is literally going up and down. So that if you look at the sea, um, at Blackpool for instance, and you'll see a fag packet floating on the water. There is one at Blackpool, I've been, I've seen the fag packet. And you think, okay, the tide's coming in, and the tide's coming in, you can see it rushing against the beach, chasing all the kids, etc. 
But the fight packet actually just goes around in a circle like that. It goes, or as you look at it, because you haven't got any reference point, you think it goes up and down. And the wave goes past it, and the fight packet comes up and comes down again. If you're lucky enough to swim out into the sea, and you get a chance of that, and the wave comes right at you, and you take your feet off the floor, it will lift you up and lower you down again. It won't throw you against the, the thing until it actually hits the, the bottom of the shore. When we see the breakers happening, it's because the land is sloped. The wave comes like this. When it hits here, it starts to rise up and to crest like this, and then it crashes against the against the uh, the beachhead. But that's because it can't it can't beat down against the thing. It's got a fixed formulation. Left. But if you manage to get past that point here, you can take your feet off the ground. I can vouch for this. I have done it. You just go mm -hmm. up and down. And it's really quite powerful. It's quite a lovely thing to do. Never bothered to learn to swim, but I've done that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The relative who was in the top in the tsunami um, <coughs> in the water said it was rather just like being in a, in a washing machine. Yeah. It just went up and down in the circles. Mm. She had an aqualung on the time, so it yeah. passed over. It was like being in a washing machine. Mm. Makes sense. It must be. Yeah. Of course, if, if you're anywhere on the land, that, that thing is extremely destructive of yes. the energy. But the energy is going that way. But the pieces, the, the matter itself is going up and down because what you've got is a pressure which is pushing itself along. Now, we were discussing this on Wednesday night actually because this is a fascinating, fascinating aspect of it is we can talk about sound and we can talk about water because we know that there's a substance there waving up and down. But in an awful lot of particle physics, they know that there's, they've got the same information about this vibration, but there is no known substance that is actually vibrating, like light, for instance. Light travels <coughs> through air, through water, and through nothing. Mm. There's nothing going up and down, but the light wavelength is moving through. So a lot of people in physics are saying, well, it's just pure information without any substantial aspect to it. And it's really peculiar because it always travels at exactly the same speed, which is really uncanny, because if you're on a train, say you're on a train here, a train, <laughs> and it's shooting along, and the light is coming at you at a constant rate, can anyone know, does anyone know the speed of light? 386,000 miles a second. It's what, sorry? 300 million meters a second. 300. <coughs> meters a sec. There's real measurement of what that. <laughs> and you're here and it's flying towards you. Miles of... <laughs> it's flying towards you at that speed. And the person at the back is looking that way. And light is coming at them at exactly the same speed. Not reduced by the speed of the train at all. Now the train is a bit facetious, I know, but if you're in a space rocket or if you're a heavenly body or you're what in whatever, the speed of speed the speed of light still comes at you at exactly the same speed. Which is really one of those things that doesn't add up to the everyday <coughs> common sense of the picture of the world. But it's a vibrational thing and light vibrates along it changes its axis. So it doesn't just vibrate that way, it also vibrates that way as well. So whatever it is that it, that it is moving through, whatever it is that we are receiving in that sense, well, the way we capture this information, it's in a matrix which we, which we uh, as yet don't understand. Perhaps we haven't been got the instruments fine enough to measure what it is actually translating through, but it is translating through something. So, don't want to go on to the next bit just yet, so, because we're going to have a break in a few minutes, are there any questions to take us through on to the break? Sorry. Um. <coughs> any thoughts about anything that we've done here? I know there's quite a bit of maths and uh, 
or have you in it, but the principles themselves are pretty sound and straightforward. Yeah. Why I think it's fast, why for me it has a, a deep resonance is because for many years now, um, and with the truths in Eugene Halliday's work, I was taught to do a thing called Turiya. And Turiya, some of you have done with me. You can spell it different ways, it's a Sanskrit word, and it means the fourth state. And what it essentially is, is that if you relax yourself very deeply and stay conscious and tune your breath very quietly, you can actually feel as if you are <coughs> tuning in to a much larger volume of space than the one you normally occupy. And if you keep at it for a long time, like a half an hour, you will get remarkably still and remarkably in tune and remarkably spread out and it feels <coughs> wonderful. And Eugene always used to say if you get your breath slower and slower and you're doing it by tiny gradations, seconds, that's all it is, to deepen your breath and deepen your breath, you are tuning in with that breath rate because your breath rate is the fundamental beat of your body. Not the heart, he said, but the breath. And that will tune you into deeper and deeper, larger and larger sections of that universe. And he said, there's no limit to what you can tune into. It's bottomless. That pit is bottomless. And it's accessible to us just as we are. And you don't have to be a genius to do it. And children are doing it, and animals are doing it, and we do it every night when we go deeply, soundlessly, dreamlessly asleep. And that's the fourth state, to rear. And to, to reach it consciously is said in yoga to be literally to understand the breath of God. Because the pralaya state is going on, that deep, uncreated state is part of that great consciousness. And we can tune into it and literally um, vibrate along with it and then gently come back <coughs> to this vibration that we particularly like to defend and look after. So the whole the universe has got to be, so in that Shavira you're sort of going into that beat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In stages and getting to the fundamental. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it felt great, but I didn't understand any of the reasoning behind doing it. So when you come across this, this particular talk, it does <coughs> link, for me, it links a great a number of these things together. And, um, and when we talk about fundamentally, we're talking about the big picture, if you like, or, or for that particular subject of anything. What is the, the thing that gathers everything together? What is it that can assimilate? all these different vibrations for us, mm. all these different people and the different attitudes and opinions and pull them together. Which is what he tended to do when you were talking to him. He always tended to break down <coughs> your particular problem or your particular um, area of study was and link it to lots and lots of others. Because that partiality is what tends to scatter us and fragment us. So tuning back into the fundamental is the one that unites us and gives us back our meaning. Our meaning in terms of the relationships that we have with all the other vibrations in the universe. You are a part of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. <laughs> and whether or not you understand that the universe is developing exactly the way it should. That's what that diagram says. At times it's really damn difficult to see. What with you keep getting into Parliament? <laughs> ISIS on the march, good God. Yeah. 
We were supposed to accept all that. We, we, <laughs> it's, all part it's all part of it. <laughs> Just before we move on. <laughs> I've certainly had a very good talk in the interval about um, harmonics and how to, to hear them and how to play them on the on the violin. And I, I do realise that I should have brought the fiddle along actually or involved one of the fiddlers present to actually um, sound them because you can hear them. Um, the rightness of a note is, is really very discernible. Uh, it, it's not, I don't think, anything you have to learn. It's something you can just hear. Like, you know, the difference between a bell um, that sound and a bell that's actually cracked. You know, it, it's, um, it's that level of sensitivity. And in a sense, I think Eugene meant that the way to work on ourselves was to, literally to sensitize ourselves because he said an awful lot of people who are uneducated actually are extremely sensitive and can feel what is wrong uh, without being able to often explain what they can feel but they know that something is wrong and that um, it isn't made properly or it doesn't sound right or it, it, it isn't <coughs> It's restricted in quite the, the, the correct way. And it certainly seems to be true um, whether or not you can get away with, uh, with just that, I don't know. But certainly with these things here, when you see the diagrams, and mine aren't as good, I'm sure, as the ones he would have done, it, it makes simple sense to you to see why things should harmonize, harmonize and why you can resonate with another person or you can make, you know, pretty sure that you don't resonate. We are <coughs> tuning ourselves all the time. We're, you know, we are allowing ourselves to be in tune with somebody or not. You know, be on the same wavelength or not. You know, and often it's a deliberate choice. Sometimes it isn't, but often it is. Right. So, if we are okay, we'll finish off with the last little bit. On the bottom of page two. So you can see that this circle can be assimilated by the big one because it's half the fundamental. So it has a natural resonance, doesn't it? And we can say that there's another one in here that you can understand assimilated by this one. Halfway there's another one, and there's. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to read. Excuse me, I'm at the bottom of page three. That's right, yes. Okay, just put that. Strange drawing which is slipped on the box. Yeah. Good recap. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if we could get a saw and make its teeth like this, and we get another saw with its teeth exactly the same pitch, they fit. Okay? So I'm going to do an easy diagram and say, okay, if the teeth fit together on a saw, this, you can imagine there's two saws. There's one there with its handle, and there's one here with its handle. So you can imagine the two of them fitting perfectly <coughs> together. Notice the economy of my drawing there. <laughs> okay. There's one technical detail there. <laughs> the teeth don't run the same way. That's true. <laughs> you, that one would cut on the pull and the other one would cut exactly. on the pull. Yeah. So one, one's a hacksaw. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> now, what we can say is that these saw things are actually in sync because their resonances are <coughs> perfectly the same. And we can use this in the Vernier scale to measure whether or not something is, uh, where you use it to, to actually measure the decimals after you've measured the width or the thickness of something, literally how the scales fit together. Because if you can put two saws together of different frequencies, for instance, one which has got lots and lots of frequencies like this on it. And you can find out, as you do, this is what the vernier is built on, is that some of them will correspond. That one doesn't. This one does. Now, notice how magically I made them correspond. You didn't think I was looking, did you? But there they are. So we can say, okay, this person 
is rabbiting on very, very quickly. This fellow is slow and steady. But look, they resonate together at certain peaks, at certain points. So they will fit together. In some degree, they will be able to resonate. They will fit together like a jigsaw puzzle to some degree at those points. Although they are very, very different frequencies, they can still hang together. Does that make sense? <clears throat> because he's going to use that to describe... Okay. We're on to page four now. Yeah. Where the teeth don't fit, it cannot assimilate, and we can't put them together. Okay? But where they do, we can actually fit them together. Now, in the case of measuring on a vernier, we have this sort of sawtooth, don't we? And a finer sawtooth, at some point, there will be a coincidence. There's one here, accidental, and the rest of them will be out. Now, if you remember, we said that if we take the six-pointed star and put a five-pointed star in it, if we put a five, the points of the five star... Sorry, if we put one point of the five, or one of the six, the rest are out of phase. Okay? <coughs> so, what he's saying is... For the six at mm. first. Yeah. <clears throat> he was, wrong now. Sorry? <laughs> wrong. Wrong. wrong point. <laughs> yes. That point there should go. No, no, that one. Yeah. yeah, that's it. I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> So what are you saying if you put the five-pointed star inside the six-pointed star and you put this one <clears throat> fitting like the tooth of a saw, if this cog here fits into that one, the others are going to be out of shrink, sink. Not by a lot sometimes, but definitely out of phase. They don't fit. So he, he's making the point that, as with that tooth scale here, there's one in one, two, three, four, five, six points here. One in six will actually meet between the larger tooth mm -hmm. down here and the smaller one up here. And that's one in six. This one here is one out of five of those going to relate. So, he's talking about the fact that <clears throat> if the universe is at a different wavelength to you, or the, the way you <clears throat> approach it, what you allow yourself to actually absorb, you have to tune yourself to it, and that literally our sensing world is out of tune. So fundamentally we say the question of assimilation is one of frequency. Sorry, and it, so I'm back into the first paragraph. Now, in the case of <coughs> Vernier, there's one here accidental. The rest of them will be out. Now, if you remember, we said before that if we take the six-pointed star and put the five-pointed star in it, if we put one point of the five on one of the six, the rest are out of phase. So you can assimilate through one sense when you are concentrated, and therefore not through the others at the same time. Because the information coming into you from the world and by the world we're representing it here as a six-phase universe, your five senses will not correspond other than in any one sense at a given point, so that you can focus, concentrate, he's saying, on one sense at a time to actually be thoroughly aware of it. So fundamentally we can say that this question of assimilation is one of frequency. And every particle of food that you eat, every drug, every chemical <coughs> is made of fundamental frequencies, that must go to their own places somewhere along this diameter line of the universe. Now what we call thinking in a man is really formal presentation, serially, isn't it? For instance, if we say, think of a cube, and here's a cube, now that is an image. Plato would have said that that's the lowest kind of thinking there is, because it's imposed of us. When we see that, we can tell that that peculiar thing isn't the same as a crescent, and we cannot be deceived by that crescent to think that this is a cube. It doesn't allow us to do so. 
In other words, you don't have, it's, it's not something which is coming from you. By looking at the two, you immediately know that they're different. It's not a, it's not a <coughs> difficult um, assessment to, to come from. It doesn't involve any rationality. So in that sense, we're, we are slaves if we work at that sense perception level. Because perceiving, say, the, these compasses closed and then we open them, it's not very smart to be able to tell that they're open when we do this and closed when we do this. It's an imposition. So man's freedom does not consist in the sense world, because the sense world merely reflects <coughs> the, what there is outside. This is why it's said that man's freedom is within. Man is not free in his relation with the external world because it imposes upon it, giving him the so-called sense data, mm. which are what they are, whether he likes it or not. So we've got this idea that assimilation is fundamentally no more than the actual resonance of already related parts of a string, which in its wider sense we can, can be called the diameter of the universe. Now when a person is thinking, there are also definite frequencies in his mind. If he looks at the light, the light imposes on him. If he looks for a long time and then looks against the dark curtain, he will then see an afterimage from the light begin to superimpose itself. If you look at the light until it fills your eye with light, and then you would begin to see colours round it and turn to a dark place, the light will form itself and you will then find it will start drifting about. And with a little bit of practice you can cause it to come near to you. This is a very peculiar thing. You can actually make it come very close, so you can examine the details. Although it really was up there, you begin to have a certain amount of power over it. Because you're now dealing with something that is half from outside and half from inside. And the nearer it is to your out outside, the greater the degree of freedom you have over it. Now this is goes right back to one of the fundamental sort of um, uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment, Locke. Who said all the thoughts that we get are captured images. When you can cap capture a light <coughs> image like that and see it on your retina after you've closed your eyes, that's the way we capture thoughts. And all the thoughts got into us like this. There's another one called Kant who said, no, it isn't as simple as that because we never get just that image. And that is literally an after effect of light on, on the back of our retina. It's when we manipulate them and when we do something with them, when we structure them and build a world out of that sense data, that's when it starts to become alive, and that's when we're actually involved in logic, which is ours. We give logic to it and structure the world. So he's a Platonist in that sense. He agrees with, uh, with Plato and Pythagoras that you're not actually thinking if you're just looking at the world and saying, well, that's a cube and that's a crescent. <coughs> you need to analyze it. You need to be able to see how they relate and, relation and build up relationships, and that's when you become logical and human. Now every frequency has a very definite chemical characteristic. And you know that when we're examining, examining <coughs> the chemistry of stellar bodies with a prism, we use spectrum analysis to determine the presence of sodium or other elements in the stars. If a surface reflects light to us, we can tell by the characteristic colors in the spectrum what chemicals there are there. That is all called ordinary physical science. What is not usually realized is this, that an emotion is also a frequency, and it has a very definite relationship with particular material substances, a frequency relationship, such that if you eat certain food, you are absorbing frequencies which tend to make you think and feel in a certain way. If you take a certain, supposing we said that is a certain substance and you eat it, well then all the partials, that is the subdivisions of that, will vibrate in you as well. And at the top level here, it is an identity of ideation, thinking, and emotion. So he's saying that actually the food that you take vibrates not just on a fundamental level, but also in its partials. <coughs> and those partials will influence not just the physical nature of your body, whether you can assimilate it or not, but also your emotions and your thinking processes. So that is, that is upon this that the restrictions about diet are based in yoga. Namely that thought itself is a kind of motion with a definite frequency and wavelength. With definite relations to the foods that you eat. So that if you are in a certain mood, you can assimilate certain foods. And if you are in another mood, you may be unable to assimilate the same food. And it's not just yoga. Most major religions have 
some sort of dietary restriction or periods of fasting or uh, alterating, altering, altering your na your natural or your everyday <coughs> diet and having sort of mm -hmm. sacred, sacred or special um, holy times when you restrict what you take into yourself and the amount of disturbance that you allow yourself. Sometimes you'll find a fellow saying, I've just been put off my food by so-and-so. So he had a good appetite and he was about to eat when somebody spake, Spurious Latius or somebody, and suddenly his appetite is gone. Why? His food is the same, the man is the same, but a stimulus has come, stimulated something in his memory, and altered his fundamental frequency, so that now he cannot deal adequately with that food. If you persuade him to swallow it, it doesn't follow that his stomach can deal with it. It might lie very heavily on his stomach for a long time. So that really, you have to tune yourself into the food that you get. Question from the audience. Would you say, for instance, that if you start to receive new ideas, it might start you to want to eat different kinds of food? Mm. Oh, yes. Well, you know that in the case of a pregnant woman, don't you? You know that they have... They start thinking that they want things that they didn't want before. And those are genuine things. They're not empty fantasies. They are chemical needs. There's a certain chemical need for making a child which previously they did not themselves need because they hadn't got that kind of emotion. <coughs> Sometimes a woman may think to herself, I am such and such a being. And then suddenly she has a child and she thinks she's another kind of being because chemical changes have occurred. She may be all right to live at a certain level, and then she changes her level emotionally. She changes her chemical need. Because there's nothing in the universe, whatever it is, a gross material, subtle material, and subtle material, which is in the mind. The mind itself is a very fine matter, and the soul, feeling, the soul specifically is the sentiency. Being, feeling, and spirituality are all matters of frequency. Whatever is has a definite beat, and the top beat of all is the beat that we call spirituality. Below that there is the psychic one, and then below that smaller and smaller. We are concerned with the gradual appearance of these partials, which are gross matter as far as we are concerned. Mm. Is everyone okay with that? this is easy, I'm just reading aloud now. This is <laughs> the diagrams are here, and um, so, yeah. So if you have anything that you don't understand, or anything you want to say because you understand it better than me, please do. Oh yes, well you know that in the, oh sorry, didn't finish. the unity of purpose, so no matter what it is, you can think of it in terms of these teeth. Do they fit, or do they not? Supposing we take all these people who are in this room, who at the moment may be assumed to be interested in certain aspects of this subject. If they are interested in the same aspect, they must be using the same frequency. Sometimes in a spiritualist circle, you'll get a request that everybody sits around and lets the little finger of the hand, say, sorry, and lets the finger of the hand, say the little finger, touches the thumb of the next person. All sit in a circle, and then all concentrate on one thing. Well, the purpose of doing that is to persuade the mind to beat in unison. Because when you've got unity, you have power. If you've got unity in your being, you've got power. Whereas if you have too many purposes, which cannot be logically related, then your power, although it is there, is dispersed in various directions. It does not appear as effective power, because it lacks unity. This is why we use meditation. We use meditation to trigger us and <coughs> before a meeting, in a sense, to gather people together so that we do choose to harmonize. And it allows for fellow feeling and um, the interchange of idea because we are resonating together. It allows for that and it draws it together. Comment from the audience. I begin to see the idea now that if you're using up energy and at a certain frequency you're going to require to take out of the food to replace that food at that frequency. Is that correct? Yes. Well, it will be shown scientifically that if a man eats exactly the same food, supposing we say to a man, here's some mashed potato, and we mash them all up to give it more or less the same, um, more or less homogeneous consistency, 
And then we divide them arbitrarily in half and say, now I want you to eat this half today. And I'm going to tell you funny stories while you eat it. And then we're going to take the excrement and measure the chemistry in it. And tomorrow you're going to eat the other half and we're going to tell you horrible stories, not funny stories. And we'll do the same thing. And it will then be shown by resonance that the man has taken something out of the one that he hasn't taken out of the other. This is going on all the time. This is why you can't get the same diet to work for different people in the same way. This is why you can't get the same drug, which will give you, say, well, let's take penicillin. It's the wonder drug of the journalists. This is probably written, sorry, this was probably given about early 1960s, I would think. So bear in mind that, um, <laughs> yes, things have changed a bit. <laughs> It's the wonder drug of the journalist, yet its percentage of successes, which is a statistical statement, is such, I think, about four years ago it was 15% of immediate success. This depends on the chemistry of the person that takes it. Giving a drug, giving any kind of treatment, whatever, where you introduce bodies from outside for assimilation, must take into consideration the type of the person that's going to receive it. His chemical type. Now, if you get a book like Culpepper's Herbal, the medicine of his day was one thing, but he was a rather unusual fellow, and he liked the old-fashioned way, <clears throat> like Paracelsus did in many ways. In fact, Paracelsus invented this modern method of injecting metals into people. For certain resonance reasons, no two people can assimilate the same substance in the same way. The same person cannot assimilate the same medicine in the same way in two separate acts. Coming from the audience. It can be quite extreme, that, um, going back to pregnant women. Yes. You know, I mean, I've known pregnant women that have actually want to eat coal. My mother would eat coal when she was having is, is me. That so some kind of, really? Is that some kind of <coughs> um, need, mm -hmm. so, you know, sort of mineral that, that they are lacking and sort of... I don't well, she's never eaten coal before or since. I know a lady that drank coffee while she was pregnant, never drank it really before, and has never drank it since. Mm. And literally, because I was there at the birth, she asked for a cup. I was going. To, I said to her, "Do you want a cup of coffee now?" And she said, "No, I'm have tea." Immediately, <laughs> mm. yeah, the damn baby was out. Yeah, can be that instant, can't it? Could that? Do you know that can help me? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's something going on, isn't there? Mm. You know? Mm. Simply. I knew I was pregnant because, a long, long time ago, I knew I was pregnant because I immediately didn't want coffee or mm. wine, both of which I love, but just didn't want them. Mm. I thought, all right, something's going on. Yep. There's a passenger. Hey? There's a passenger. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm? We do seek minerals, though. This, the, my daughter, when she did her PhD, she worked on um, coenzymes, and mm -hmm. apparently some strain of monkey in the Far East that seeks out apricot kernels. Mm -hmm. Doesn't eat the apricot, splits the kernel and eats the nut because there's a trace element in the kernel. Yes. And it needs it to survive. <clears throat> it always fascinates me, fascinates me, Mac, when you, you think of, of, of how some of these things are so well hidden mm -hmm. that people find them. I mean, there's, there's a form of beer. I always remember watching it in, uh, when I was a boy, and it struck me then. There's a carver beer, which they drink in <coughs> South America, <coughs> which is poisonous unless you distill it five or six times. It's poisonous the first time, and the second time, and the third time. And you think to yourself, no, how many of these natives died before they, <laughs> they finally got a decent If drink. any died. <laughs> if any died. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Because, you know, you think, it's just incredible, isn't it? Why did they keep this thing? Why did they keep doing yeah. it? What made them cry? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, what is this stuff? There's um, ayahuasca now. It's, yeah. it's very, very poisonous. Both the two um, constituents, they have to be put together before the, the body can assimilate them. And both of them are very, very toxic. It's like toxic fish in Japan. It, yeah. Who was the one that first got the... cooked it right? Mm. Yeah. 
Or blue cheese, who was the first one who put that stuff in his mouth? <laughs> who made copper wire that shoved it in the cheese? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, certainly, we, this seems to be to work on an instinctive level. Um, things like coal, for instance, I mean, the chemistry that you probably, it's probably a, a dense carbon, so I have no idea. But the fact that someone turns to that and, and recognizes it, well, it might be in this, yeah. I'll try a bit of this here. Because it's. You actually crunch it up. Yeah. It's actually crunchy. Mm. 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 Small pieces, yeah. <laughs> it's actually tasty, strangely enough. But it does sometimes, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Your children will select a food that's got the elements in it that they need, mm. even if it doesn't taste nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Babies. Well, babies will eat all sorts of muck and things, won't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I certainly <laughs> 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 And they, they go, hey. and then they do it again. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. So you'd have to say that there's something instinctively which seems to drive us like that. I remember watching a TV program about elephants that go into a particular cave to get sulfur, which is in the cave. And to get that, they have to sort of spit on the, on the stone and rub it for a while, and then ingest that again. Now, anywhere else in, in, in Africa, they don't seem to need the sulfur, but these elephants just seem to need it. They get addicted to it. Peculiar. Fine with horses if you offer them different <coughs> herbs from, from the fields surrounding where they, they're living in. They'll actually choose the herbs that mm. are the, their, their ma matches their residence. Yes. So if they're unwell, they'll choose the herbs that suit them, and then they go out and gather those herbs and mm. feed them. And then after a few days, they'll stop wanting to eat that and get right. it all over again. <laughs> Cats do the same, don't they? We did have the opposite of that, because we once, for our sins, went on a horse-drawn caravan holiday. And while we were at this, of course, the, um, <coughs> when you're on a horse-drawn caravan, <laughs> apart from just being away from, the, about a metre away from the biggest methane producer I've ever seen in your life, <laughs> We found that the, the horse would often, he was walking through a bowl of salad really, wasn't he? Yeah. And he was eating, he picked up a chemistry, he ate a flower, also the owner said, that destroyed his response to ultraviolet. So he got sunburnt on his nose and round his eyelids, which is the only place a horse can get sunburnt. Yeah. And he was in a, in a bad way. Yes. And they said, you know, it's this particular guy and he does it regularly, so it's like as if, you know, he, he can't resist this stuff, but it, it really sort of torments him. So yes, there are, and they seem to, and obviously he got it wrong, but I mean, was, that was quite peculiar, wasn't it? Mm. Was that? And he had a sort of a red, a red nose with sunburn. You didn't think the horse getting sunburn. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. Crazy. Yeah. Right, why an egg becomes a human being. That is why it's said, <clears throat> to be now a, a statistical science. The 18th century dreamed that there was a definite number of material particles which, as they were said to be fortuitously running about and producing accidentally a universe, and their velocities and directions being known, you should be able to write the history of the universe forwards and backwards. Now, those lucky people who managed to come to my class on a Wednesday night will know that quote actually, because we actually discussed the the actual the, the quote. It's from a chap, <coughs> French, a French um, physicist called Laplace, and that was a dream. It it's no correspondence at all with fact. They had never at that time seen atoms walking about and colliding, fortuitously getting together to make a frog or something. It was an assumption, a kind of dream. Because the mind of man is always looking for a final explanation, which if he gets it, he thinks he can stop and fold his arms and that will be the end of it. But the universe isn't like that. The universe is fundamentally a continuum of power. And because it is a continuum, a straight line, these things which science counts, because science is based on measurement, on statistical measurement of that, these things can never tell you what's going on down here. So what he's actually saying is, to, to get into the deep levels, in this field, you cannot get into that by just a simple surface level of analysis. 
you have to go deep into it and that is constantly revealing itself and subdividing and building itself so as opposed to a fortuitously bumping together an accidental universe Pythagoras, Plato um, we're all recognizing the fact that there seems to be a fundamental structure and I mean fundamental a structure which is sonically dividing the universe up which is then mathematically and ge geometrically perfect and that this seems to be a governance of all the forms from the great, <coughs> literally the great sidereal circles into the stellar, the solar and the planetary ones <coughs> whenever we look at them and are able to measure them there seems to be a resonance factor and a sequence of it now when this thing here <coughs> starts to examine the world it can only focus it at one particular point so <coughs> this is a reference to the fact that this has a particular frequency if we take that as a sense <coughs> that has a particular frequency if we take that as a sense and that has one and that has one and that has one so if we take this big circle as having 360 degrees we're luckily or if we like we're only talking about one sense being in sequence with the rest of this whole universe of vibrations so that one if you concentrate on it you'll get in sync but all the others will be missing so he's actually saying that the fact that we have to come from that and go deep inside ourselves really to understand how the structure of the universe might be analyzed sorry not analyzed but synthesized out of the information that we're seeing from our, from our senses when we concentrate on them so it's a question of going into the self to see what's underneath rather than what's actually on the surface the invention of an infinitesimal calculus is an attempt to deal with smaller <coughs> and smaller and smaller distances between here but it can't deal with nothing there's an attempt in mathematics to deal with what we are calling what are called infinite qualities they borrowed the Hebrew letter Aleph and by using the term Aleph Nu, which means a number when added, multiplied or divided by itself to make precisely what it was in the first time, namely zero, is an attempt to get down to this substratum, the nothingness. Most people think it's meaningless, but it isn't. It's an attempt to discover why this baseline can produce these ripples. Why does an egg become a human being? You look inside it with a microscope, all you can see is some little things with knobs on in the old days they used to think that inside an egg was a little <coughs> man waiting to have his dinner and grow big <laughs> there are drawings by Leonardo I like that actually yeah. showing this you know. hmm. it isn't true <coughs> inside there are some weird little weird granules but somehow they are the vehicle whereby a force outside them namely the macrocosmic force presses into that egg and produces a man out of it somehow the man isn't in the egg He's outside the egg, but he gets into the egg by pressing on it and producing modulations which fundamentally are frequencies. You take, say, the high bridge nose of the Jews as a race. That high bridgeness there is a product of haughtiness of spirit, <coughs> of thinking high. Each nation has a definitely psychological tendency which produces a physical structure because the modeler of form is first feeling, first feeling, and then the function and then the ratification of the function in material so the feeling level he's saying is the one that actually is the field level it's tuning into a field of forces and drawing from them the structure and to project that project that structure into the material situation so that in the egg the egg is an extremely responsive um, substance it's responsive to the feeling level of the being that's trying to build its body and presumably in doing that it's requiring certain certain chemistries or certain um, necessary foodstuffs that will resonate with it and help it to produce the body that it's trying to build <coughs> it's fascinating that it you know that they do produce something which is distinctly like other members of the family and yet also it's always fascinating to me very individual you know, it's always interesting to go to a wedding or a 
or a funeral or a christening or something and see the whole all the family and to see the the variations on a theme if you like you know the same nose passed down through different generations and the patterns, <coughs> even the um the different patterns of ear shape and stuff everybody's got a similar <coughs> but also they've also got a particular distortion of that a particular influence of that and that is fascinating to see what um, about the throwback Sorry? What about the throwbacks that happen within that kind of arrangement? With, for example, there was some African blood in the family, 15 generations previous, and then suddenly there's a, yeah, an African coloured child born into that family. <coughs> well, this is to do with the fact that the DNA actually stores this information yeah. and is, is looking to self it's yeah. uh, and usually it's because it's come from the other side of the family yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's two have collided yeah. 15 generations later. Yeah. I know it's very strange. Fascinating. I have a son with red hair. I was only saying to Ginger that That's not his fault, I've got red hair. We're a dying breed. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere back there, probably on both sides of the family, there would be red. Yeah. The, red the, the genetic thing for red, which is. You know, has been waiting, mm. if you like, to get find another cognitive mm. that it can click into and then produce. Um, Genetics, think, dangerous yeah. ground. Yeah. <laughs> but it's certainly very, really quite complicated. And again, mathematically understandable, but until, you know, it really takes a lot of analysis and a lot of um, manipulation of the information before you can see the pattern that is, really, that is actually being produced. <coughs> So we can say about diseases in general, they begin with feelings slightly of colour. If the person becomes hypnotised by that, or begins to, th to think it's useful to dodge some issue, then he starts working upon this feeling, and gradually he alters his substance and produces malfunctioning. <coughs> if he um, produces his disturbance of function over a long time, he can make an organic breakdown. An organic breakdown doesn't just start like that. It starts by some functional disorder, which starts by some feeling disorientation to begin with. So that the more we can control and elevate the feeling and make it more positive, the more unity there will, uh, there will appear in the physical body. The whole point in yoga terms is to become ekachita, to have a one-pointed mind. Just have one aim and subordinate everything else to that. <coughs> what contradicts it has to go. Now that's quite a harsh statement, that, because it's, it's implying that illness is <coughs> in some way colluded to by the person. That, they, you know, that, that this, uh, this um, feeling slightly off colour is developed or is allowed to be done. <coughs> and I think that's, um, it's a harsh thing to say. I think it's true in certain cases, and it's certainly been true in, in my case, I can remember as a child, making myself ill, and then becoming terrified when I realised I was very ill. <laughs> and, you know, I just thought, oh my God, what the hell have I done? And um, it seemed to come back and really give me a severe blow. So I can, I can actually agree with that completely. But there are also times when um, not actually feeling very ill at all, suddenly you're struck down with something which is really quite dangerous and... Um, there was no glimmer of it coming, and it didn't seem to be based in emotion. But uh, so I've, ha I've had the experience of both. I can understand anybody who's completely surprised when they get a diagnosis which is, just comes out of the blue. Now Ken mentioned the zodiac, and while we're talking about assimilation, we can deal with that. <coughs> this circle cuts itself spontaneously into the right number. Now if we bisect the angles between these, there's our six pointer. So, <clears throat> you've probably done this with a compass. Have you done this with a compass? Everybody? Yeah, so. <coughs> it's going to do the, the zodiac. I won't draw it actually because John's done it so well there. I don't think it needs any, any assistance from me. This is really a device which fundamentally a new way of dealing with the macrocosmos the big universe itself. 
I'm reducing it down to the level where it is useful to men. This is how he used it here. He drew that <coughs> six-pointed star in there as a symbol for the macrocosmos because it's, it's a perfect one. It's the one that the struck compasses will draw. So going back to the Greeks again, it's not based on measurement, it's based on a proportional thing which is always the same. And it's <coughs> referencing the very fact that the... Um, the, of the, the way that the circumference fits into the, in, the diameter, sorry, fits into the, into the circumference, it's referencing all of those. And in fact, when he draws through the cube, there is a way of drawing the cube in this particular way that references this and acknowledges the four-dimensional world within that six-dimensional shape. <coughs> He's actually using this as a macrocosmic symbol. So when he says here, this is really a device that is fundamentally a new way of dealing with the macrocosmos, the big universe itself. He's referencing the fact that this big circle, the great sidereal circle, and the zodiac, which is referenced as the guide to it, because we have the 12 animal groups of stars, which are roughly, and they're not, they're not in any way regular, because they're just a star pattern. Some of them are very small, and some of them are very large. But if we use them as key points to divide the universe as we see it against the background of the sun, against the background of the zodiac, then we've got 12 ways of um, analyzing the whole of the macrocosmos. So this is why he's got this here, which, is, which John's drawn for us, by using the arcing of the, of the compass points and separating them out and giving the 12-pointed uh, star. You have to divide, you have to do the six points and then bisect the angle, which he shows you there, and then you get the 12. The circle cuts itself spontaneously into the six pointer and we bisect these angles and produce our 12. <coughs> we draw one little circle and another, and another, and another for ease of analysis. Try a try, try it. If we draw one circle and we put in it a triangle that way, and we'll write on it the sign of the ram, Leo, and Sagittarius there. And you see the ram is like a V. You probably know it. Now that is a so-called fire triad taken out. And actually refers to the nervous system of the human being. The being's nervous energy. Okay? Do you all know this sort of thing before? <coughs> or is, this, is this new to you? Yes? No? no? <coughs> Remember? Yeah. You're right? Okay. So I'll go through it fairly easy. If anybody wants me to stop me or, or to, to say, ask me any questions about it, I'll do my best to answer it. So he's relating the fire triad with nervous energy. Then the earth triad. We invert that one and we put in this triad. In, and this at the bottom, Libra, and there Aquarius, and there Gemini. Now that's our earth triad, which has to do with intellect. Ideas and the respiratory apparatus. The breathing apparatus in your body. Breathing is very closely linked with thinking, very closely linked with judgment. You know that when you start judging events, your breathing alters. If you decide that something is very, very bad and should be stopped, you find that your breathing begins to reflect your judgment. The Greek word for lungs is phren, which means mind. So they knew that there was a very close relation between thinking and breathing. And of course you can fire ideas at people and make them very excited so that their breathing accelerates and they get palpitations. And yet you've only spoken to them. It shows the power of judgment over the breathing apparatus, particularly water triad. Now we have here the water triad. That's a triangle there with cancer earth. I'd better write this in full. Write 69 lying on its side. And that's the sign of cancer. Scorpio down here, which is an M with an arrow on its tail. And then the sign of Pisces up here, which is two semicircles back to back. <coughs> All these names, by the way, are not magical. They're basically just the Latin names for those, for those particular creatures. Pisces is just simply fish. <coughs> Earth triad. And then over here, the, the final triad, Capricorn, which is the which is the sign of the ram, plus the sign of Taurus. Taurus is the sign of the Grecian thing, I won't draw. A loop. Mm. <laughs> Capricorn is a goat, not a ram. Yes, 
I'd sort of stop them. <coughs> what I think he's saying is it, it's um, it's the sign of the ram plus the sign of Taurus. Oh, right. Um, I'd stop me in my idea, tracks yeah. as well. Yeah. A loop, and Virgo is like an M with the same loop added to it. I'll just show you those. They're a bit difficult. The sign of the ram is like that, and the sign of Taurus is like that. If we add Taurus here to the ram, it's the sign of the goat. Right. So what he's saying here is that that's the sign of the ram, energy going in, and Taurus, he's saying here, is like that. You put them together and you've got the sign of the goat. All matter is rotation and power. So that when we're talking about the matter of your, your body, we're talking about rotations of power. Did I? Taurus. There's Taurus on its own, that bit? Yeah. There's Taurus on its own. We do a letter M, sorry, and then we put the sign of Taurus on it at the side. So in these three earth signs, we're using the sign of Taurus three times. And that's because that Taurus means to turn. Tor, you see, that's rotor, you see. What he's saying is, and this is true of Arabic and Hebrew, <coughs> that in Arabic and Hebrew you don't have any vowels. So the important thing, well, you, you have one, um, is the consonants. And the consonants have a great deal of meaning in themselves. And they used to also write from in one direction and get to the end of the page and write back the other way. Nowadays, Arabic is written backwards to the way we would write. But they used to write both ways. So the consonants, Eugene would say, are very important for getting the meaning. And the R and the T together always mean that rotation. And we have it in the word rota, we have it in the word tor, torus, and all these sorts of words which are to do literally with that repetition. The circularity which gives you a measurement of time. Without that circularity, Things repeating themselves, remember we said spring is always when there's a particular star pattern in the sky, so we can recognize it, it can be then become a law, or a role, it can become a law, and then when it's absolutely nailed down, it will become a law like this, because we'll actually put enough energy into it to make it very real, and we'll know exactly how it works. But a law like that is one literally of a repetition, we would call it tradition. If something is, you know, we'd say it's a traditional law of that, and we mean that this is what is it's done by habit. It becomes fixed and defined properly in a state, in a <coughs> nation, when you can actually hold someone to account for it and use it to, um, to punish them. And it's always to do with repetition of a particular thing. Mm. Cycles repeat themselves and they are therefore recognisable. If the pattern of the earth didn't repeat itself regularly, we would have no way of dividing it up and understanding it. It's only because it makes a pattern by doing the same thing at the same time every year that we can recognize it, parcel it up and say, oh, this is the law. This is how it rolls. This is the tour. That's rotis. All matter is rotation of power. So when we're talking about the matter of your body, we're talking about rotations of power. And remember I said that that vibration is only a rotation of power pushed through time or seen through time. We would tend to say that you have to see these things in different directions. <coughs> My father used to say to me that he had a very old Greek idea. He said, the pendulum swings. And however far it swings one way, it's going to swing back the other way. He usually said that when I'd beat him at cards. <laughs> now what you've got there is again a vibration. You've got something which is swinging between two poles. Now if that's a rotation, like that, we've got the diameter being constantly worked out. Now if you push time through that, as it swings, you will get that. Yeah? So you've got this... 
You've got the same vibrational yeah. thing with time going downwards, like this, to pass the pendulum. <coughs> so that swinging of the pendulum is exactly the same as a wave motion. You've set the wave motion up. And as we know from pendulum, the length of the string of the swing is so sophisticated. You know, you, we, we know so much about these pendulum. You can use them to check the emission, the emit, of time. So energy emission, in terms of sequences and in terms of the amount of energy that you get given out, I'll go over that <coughs> because my, my pen is giving up the ghost a bit. The emission of energy in sequence is what we call time. And if we use that thing I just said about the, the way that the Hebraica writes, the way a man plows a field, you can see that the TM root there and the MT is always to do with that emission of energy and therefore time. So that vibration that way is what he's talking about in the same vibrational rate. And the Greeks are noticing the fact that things seem to vibrate like that. And in a moment he's going to say, if you want to stop yourself being bipolar, as we call it now, <coughs> The, the swinging between this pole and that pole, where this is great and that is awful, then what you have to do is stop the oscillation, stop the swinging being so grand. And the way to do that is to limit the positive swing and it will limit the negative swing simultaneously because you can only swing, as my father said, so far one way and then it starts to swing back the other way. So you draw yourself into the central, even keel, if you like. And an even keel, you spin down between those fluctuating, vibrating, swinging motions. So all these are coming back to the very same sort of vibrational thing. The energy comes at us in waves of positive, negative, if you like. And they oscillate between each other. And that oscillation is different from different... Various substances, people, times, sequences, etc. So, in the case of the earth sign, it's to do with your physical body, which manifests in the specific, manifests in the specifically in the bone structures, which are the nearest things to the mineral world, aren't they? They're the parts that, when you get hold of a living human being and boil him until the flesh boils off. I've never done this, but I'm taking his word for it. It's something that's still there. That's the bone. And that's the real, earth, really earth part of you. The rest of the stuff is, if you get a living man and heat him up, you'll drive off the most volatile substances first. Then you'll find various sediments chemically afterwards. All those added together are the earth substances in the body. Now we'll consider what they are. I'm going to put, I'll put the ram... I'll put the sign of the ram in here for a moment. It should have been at the top. We'll call that 12 o'clock. Then it goes round Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, <coughs> Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. Now I want you to think about this as a psychosomatic device. It tells you something about your mind and something about your body at the same time. When we come to consider the earth signs, that's Capricorn, Taurus and Virgo, we can see very clearly what it means. This means assimilation, absorption. This Capricornian, the goat, is the being that has a go at anything. You know that it the has a go at. <laughs> Which is play on words. You know that the symbol of the goat in the Old Testament is that person that throws himself into the situation and gets into trouble. <coughs> Therefore, we talk about the scapegoat. The, pe the being that pays the price of other people's carefulness in dangerous situations. There's always one that can't control himself and rushes forward first. And he's the one who gets blamed, although everybody wanted to do the same thing. So this fellow, who must have a go at it, is called the ghost. Okay? I'm not part of his armor. I think it's a gross misinterpretation of the, of the true sensitivity of that time. I can't agree. <laughs> and you know that the goats in general are not herded in the plains like sheep. 
they jump on the mountaintops. So that when it says that the separating of the sheep and the goats in Revelation, it means separating those independent spirits that are always trying to do it on their own from the massed spirits called sheep. And where the goats have to go and where the sheep have to go is not necessarily a bad thing. The goats, where the goats go, that's where they go. It's called hell to sheep because the sheep like to get together, but the goats like to be independent. This is why Jacob Verma says the angels call the good good, but the devils call the bad good. So this is your primary absorption of matter. So a person born with the stress on there is really pitched in this <coughs> necessity of absorbing matter through food. And this sign, Taurus, means secretion. It has to do with the glandular system, the food that you have absorbed. <coughs> You now hide it in certain centers in the body, glands of internal secretion, and you store it there, and you let a bit of it out every now and again, and it goes around the body. And this one, Virgo, has to do with the circulation of the food. So that's three processes, taking the food in, hiding the food in particular parts of the body at the glandular system, and then circulating it to produce a balanced whole. Remember, we said last week that the chemistry in different parts of the human body, the blood, is not the same. The chemistry of the blood in the brain is not the same as the chemistry of the blood in your thigh muscle. Because each part of the body has some substance being manufactured and being poured into it at that part. So there is high saturation of a, certain chemical from a of a certain chemical from a gland. And far away there is less saturation of the <coughs> and something else is the dominant influence. So that the same chemical injected into one part of the body of the same man will not produce the same effect if you inject it into another part of the same man, because he's chemically different in different places. Now I mentioned Culpepper before, and he said it is no good knowing the right remedy unless you've got the right man to give it to, and it's time. <coughs> and when he said it's time, he meant to say that there's a definite relation and resonance between something that most people would tend to scoff at but not modern scientists. They're a bit cautious now. Namely that certain plants have definite relationships with certain planets. They were anciently, uh, sorry, they were said anciently to be under the dominion of Mars, of Venus, and so on. We know that all vegetable life is very, very close statistical relationship with the planet Venus. We know that the coffee in Brazil is largely <coughs> determined by the Venusian cycle. And we know that the moon itself has a profound effect on germination. This statistically, which is the same thing as saying scientifically. And the scientists therefore are today considering less, are considerably less dogmatic about this. And he said, if a planet is ruling a certain plant, when you take that plant and abstract from it a certain chemical and give it to a man who is antipathetic to that planet, it won't help him. It will annoy him. We talk about man as being, <coughs> say in ancient terms, we might have said a man is choleric. That is a, ma a man that tends to fly into bad tempers. He's an angry man and so on. They had four types of men. And those four types are still valid and they're still involved here, as we will see. The first, the absorption, taking in, the storing or secretion in particular places, then the rotation or circulation of those to maintain harmony of the body. That is for the physical things. We'll come back to them again in a minute. <coughs> okay? Mm. Have we had enough? No. no. <laughs> Can I have a second opinion? Yes. <laughs> I mean, going on. I am just reading this because it's very self-explanatory and the diagrams are extremely yeah. good. I'm just fascinated with what's going to happen in water trying. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, yes, I can, we could do the water try and get that. Yes, we'll do the water try. <coughs> now, we take the water science, so called, which have to do with all the fluids in your body, all the fluid substances, and these are peculiarly related to your feeling, just like the bones are a lever system related to your motor activities, so the water signs are related to the fluids of your body. And when we start with cancer, it means the whole of the fluids in your body. When we talk about Scorpio, it means particulars. And when we talk about Pisces, it means, like Virgo meant, the circulation again, the relating factor. 
So a person with distress has a diffused feeling awareness, the cancer type. The Scorpio type has gathered his feeling together and he's a very zealous man. Zeal is his essential characteristic. And the Pisces type is an emotional man. He's whizzing it round, tends it flying out. There's a certain amount of unity in Scorpio, but it manifests as zeal and drive. There's a lot of disunity emotionally in Pisces. It tends to split itself out into many, diverse, many, many diverse ways. But it's all to do with the fluids of the body and the, the life of feeling. So that's at the psyche. These signs, Earth, are like the gross physical body. This water is like the soul life, the feeling life. Then there's a break in the recording. And now we shall break. Thank you very much for your listening.